As you do, please take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be continuing our slow journey through this wonderful letter in a series that uh, I think is aptly titled, Christ is Life. This morning we're going to begin reading at verse 17 and go down to verse 19. That's going to be our text. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. This, we're about to read, is the Lord's holy and authoritative word speaking to us this morning. Paul writes, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame. With minds set on earthly things. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word in our midst today. Press Maravich is known for being the head basketball coach at LSU during the 1960s. He's probably even more known for his son, former NBA superstar Pistol Pete Maravich. What's less known about Press, however, are his days, his career as a decorated Navy pilot during World War II. And that's probably because he didn't like to talk about it very much. But one story has survived down through through the decades. And it's a story that comes from a particular bombing run that he was assigned to one stormy evening over the Pacific Theater. He he had a new navigator, and, and he and his new navigator, their squadron, had been deployed to destroy strategic targets under the cover of darkness. That was their role. And so after they had completed their sortie one evening, the plane was running fairly low on fuel. So press radios back to his navigator. He says, hey, man, we got to turn around. we got to get back. What's the quickest way back to base? We need to get there ASAP. We're low on fuel. The navigator uncomfortably and nervously radioed back that he wasn't exactly sure. To which Maravich understandably replied in the moment, what do you mean you don't know? Isn't that your job? Like you have one job to do. That's it. And at literally the worst possible moment, this navigator had to fess up. He had to come clean. He was a complete sham. He'd actually cheated his way through navigation school, and he really didn't have any clue where he was or how to get home. Years later, when recounting that night, Press said that he was so angry, he had a pistol under his seat, and he says, I was tempted more than once to see if I could reach around behind me with that pistol. The good news from that evening is that Maravich was able to guide them both safely back to base before they shortly ran out of fuel. But the truth of this near-death experience is still ringing out for us today. Because despite what people claim, we need to be very careful that who we're following actually knows where they're going. We need to be very careful of that. That's what Paul is warning the Philippian church, about in our text this morning. That's what he's saying. Be careful who you're following, because not everyone who bears the name of Christ is going to be pointing you towards the future prize that we find in the gospel. And much is at stake in our decision. It's important to remember that these are the earliest days of Christianity. The church doesn't have access yet to the completed New Testament canon. And so there's a vulnerability for the Philippians, right? It's important, you know, to, to, to be think, put yourself in their shoes. How do you know exactly? How do you know exactly who you're supposed to be following? And so Paul, he writes these verses to protect them. To protect them from those who might claim a certain kind of Christian credibility, and yet at the same time, they're functionally denying Christ by their immersion in this present age. That's what they're doing. And we today need to listen intently to this same warning. 
Because despite having more access to information than any generation in history, it's increasingly clear that our walls in this category are way, way too low. It's easy to be low to sleep here. Because more information may make, make, make us feel safe. But, but listen, more information doesn't necessarily lead to more discernment. In fact, it can often have the opposite effect in our lives. So as critical as this warning was for the church in Philippi in their moment, it's just as critical for us today in ours. Be careful who you're following actually knows where they're going. Our passage divides into two contrasting points, and so those are the two points of the message today. The the first is those who are leading us up the costly path of glory. That's in verse 17. And second, those who are leading us down the self-indulgent path of destruction. That's in verses 18 and 19. Those leading us up the costly path of glory, and those leading us down the self-indulgent path of destruction. So let's consider that first point. Those who are leading us up this costly path of glory. Paul has just finished a lengthy autobiographical section. He's been unpacking his greatest passion in life to them. It's to press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And then as we saw in verse 15, he goes on to say that this mindset of of pressing on towards future glory, that mindset is the measure of Christian maturity. But now he turns to the church, and he calls them. He says, come on. He calls them to join him on this road. The original term term that he uses for imitating is conveying this idea of mimicry, something that looks identical to whatever it is it's trying to duplicate. Now, certainly Paul doesn't mean for them to copy his unique calling as an apostle, but rather he's calling them to become imitators of him in his gospel-shaped future-oriented lifestyle. Gospel-shaped, future-oriented lifestyle. That's what he's calling them towards. We want to pause and make a few observations about this method that Paul is laying out for them. Notice that he isn't pointing them primarily to a checkbox of rules that he's, that he's sent them. Nor is he this spiritual guru who is dispatching his philosophy and his knowledge from on high. No, he addresses them as his brothers, and sisters in Christ. And he sets before them a real life, flesh and blood example. See that there at the beginning of verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me by sharing his very life with them, both while he was with them in person, but also by intimately opening up to them in these letters that he sent them. By doing that, he's providing a model for them to follow, a personal model that they can see, a tangible way forward. This pattern of life wasn't for Paul only. It's meant to be passed down. Look again at the middle of verse 17. He says, there's a second part to this command. So join in imitating me. And then the second part is this. They're also to keep their eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul is aware of the limitations that his physical absence brings. And so he's pointing them to others in their midst as well. And notice that there's three. This is a sweet thing. There are three generations in this one phrase. You see that there? He's telling them the third generation, that's who he's talking to, brothers, you keep your eyes, and you keep your eyes on the second generation. You keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example. But then that second generation, that that example isn't theirs. It didn't originate with them. They're walking according to the example they received from the first generation. The in us there that Paul is talking about is probably a reference to Paul and his missionary companions when they first came to Philippi. And so we can see how Paul believes that this gospel-shaped, future-oriented lifestyle is passed down. What's the most effective way for this to be passed down? It's not just information that's distilled to the bare, it's been distilled down to the bare essentials and then broadcast as far as it can be broadcast. Instead, it's this holistic discipleship that's intentionally passing down this gospel from one generation to the next. And we see that it isn't one size fits all. There's not a prepackaged formula that he's referencing here. The the method can, can, and and oftentimes it will vary according to different gifts and moments in history and locations. But no matter what it looks like, the heart behind it is the same, to make sure that every new generation of Christians has mature believers, people they can look to and see the difference that the gospel makes in every area of life. 
It's one of the wonderful roles that we're entrusted with as parents, providing our children this model to follow. But it doesn't stop there. All of us as Christians are called. We're called to be looking forward to those who are ahead of us in this road. But we're also called to be proactively taking responsibility for those who are coming after us. Who has God put in your life that you can be looking to? And who are those that he's put in your life that possibly should be looking to you on this road? Those are wonderful questions to ask, but there's also, there's also an urgency in answering them. Because as we'll soon see, there's a competing model, a competing version of Christianity. It's being heavily promoted. It was being heavily promoted in Paul's day, and it's being heavily promoted in ours. So who are those people that God has put in your life? But now that we've considered the method, we also want to be clear about what it is exactly that we are to be passing down. The example that Paul is calling them to wasn't open to interpretations. It wasn't negotiable. It wasn't to be adjusted or altered to meet cultural norms or to, or to, to fill in practical concerns. No, this is the path that the Savior had blazed. And so as his followers, there's no short-circuiting it for us. Listen, Jesus never, he never uncoupled the glorious promises that we have in him from the costly pattern that he left for us to follow. That never happened in his ministry. And, and Paul knew, Paul knew that these costs were higher than we ever will. We do well to remember that he's writing his words as a man in chains. But, but, Paul had also seen proof He'd seen proof of something else. This costly road was leading up to a glorious end. F.F. Bruce describes how seeing the resurrected Christ had radically transformed Paul's life. He writes, Whatever Paul's earlier position on immortality may have been, it was decisively modified by his conversion to Christianity. This conversion resulted immediately and inevitably from his vision of the risen Lord who called him to be his apostle. What he had previously refused to admit, that the crucified Jesus had been raised from the dead by the power of God as the earlier apostles maintained, was now borne in upon him by testimony too compelling to be doubted. Jesus was therefore the Messiah, the Son of God, the highly exalted Lord, but more especially for our present purpose. With Jesus rising from the dead, the expected resurrection had begun to take place. What had been for Paul previously the resurrection hope was now, so far as Jesus was concerned, more than a hope. It was fiat accompli. In other words, Paul saw that Christ had already settled the matter. It was done. There was no longer any doubt. It was finished. And that's precisely why Paul lived. That's why he lived according to this gospel-shaped future-oriented lifestyle. That's what led him there. Paul's future destination had been secured in the past, and it charted his present course. That's what's there. His future destination had already been secured in the past. He'd seen that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so therefore it charted his present course. That's where he was headed. That's why he was willing to share in the sufferings of Christ. That's why he is willing to become like him in his death. Because he knows, he's seen what's on the other side of that. Resurrection from the dead. To imitate Paul, then, is to daily rely on and live in light of Christ's bodily resurrection. That's what it means to imitate Paul. That's the pattern that he left. Contrary to how it may appear now, believers in Jesus objectively know, they objectively know, that following him isn't a dead end. And so they press on despite the costs because they know exactly where they're headed. That's the life that we're called to pursue by looking to others. And that's the life that we're called to pass down to those who are coming after us. It's a life of looking. It's a life of looking. Look. Look and see him on the cross. Consider, consider him yourself there too in all your sin and all your shame, but look. Look at the empty tomb. Look up and see your own life. 
already secure, where it can't be lost, where it can't be damaged. See how it's hidden in the very one who reigns in heaven. People who glory in that, who delight in that, they're living a gospel-shaped, future-oriented lifestyle. They know where they're going because they've spent time looking behind and looking ahead. Follow those people. Paul's saying, follow those people. Listen to them. They are on the road that you want to be on. And we soon see why this is so vital in the second part of our passage this morning. Because there are many who are attempting to lead this church down the self-indulgent path of destruction. Look with me in verses 18 and 19. That's the second point. Those leading us down the self-indulgent path of destruction. Immediately we find out why Paul has been so urgently calling the Philippians to fix their eyes on those who walk according to his example. We see that this isn't a nice optional add-on for the church. It's a desperately needed protection so that they will keep on running this resurrection race that he's laid out before them. Follow his logic here in verse 18. He says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Why, Paul? For many of whom I have often told you and tell you even now with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. That's the reason right there. There were people who either used to be uh, claim the name of Jesus Christ or they, they're still claiming him, but presently they are walking as enemies of his cross. And the commentators are split as to who exactly this group of people may have been and and what level of influence that they held in this church. But Paul is laying out enough of a picture here for us to grasp what this looks like, to what it means to walk as an enemy of the cross. Odds are these folks are not denying the gospel message itself. So it's unlikely that the people he's referencing are the same Judaizers that he mentioned to open chapter 3. But the problem they pose for the church is still very real. It's equally as dangerous, perhaps even more so, more tempting for certain people. The major issue is that these folks had accepted pieces of Paul's message. Certainly they were happy to embrace a God of love, one who would forgive and accept them just as they were, but they weren't, clearly weren't so keen. They weren't so excited about the whole holiness part, the whole dying to self part of his message. That, that felt a bit extreme. In other words, they had bought into a partial Christianity, one that in the end would prove to be a false version altogether, to Christianity that wanted the glory of the next life, but not at the expense of this one, to Christianity that wanted the crown of glory apart from the cross of shame. This wasn't so much a problem of false teaching as it was a problem of false living. And so even though they may not have been preaching outright heresy by refusing to follow this path of Jesus, the one that Paul had left for them, the example that he had, they were in effect still enemies of the cross. P.T. O'Brien gives us a helpful glimpse into their hearts. This is what he says. Accordingly, those who are enemies of Christ's cross have failed to accept the death of the old life and have disqualified themselves from the new. We don't know if they were still attempting to cling to their own morality, or whether they still wanted to indulge in depravity. could be either one of those things. But nailing down exactly who they were isn't as essential for us in understanding the greater danger that they pose. That's what's important for us to grasp this morning. Paul is keenly aware And he's trying to help them see that dualism isn't a real option. Dualism isn't a real option. Those who are trying to straddle both, straddle both sides, they're going to soon find out how impossible that is. You can't walk in newness of life while still keeping your old one on life support. Christ himself had drawn this sharp distinction in Luke 9 when he says, If anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed 
when he comes in glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jesus said, you're either in or you're out. Those are your choices. As Christians, we aren't afforded a comfortable middle ground in this life. There's no such thing. And it's a dangerous illusion to buy into the the fact that there is one. It's a dangerous illusion. But this group, by how they walked, it's clear. By how they walked, their pattern of life, it's clear that they they were unwilling to embrace that truth. They were unwilling to embrace these words, this challenge of discipleship that Jesus had laid out. And notice, that's why Paul thinks that this infectious way of thinking is such an imminent threat to the well-being of the church. They're calling them away from following this master, the road that the master had called them to. And this isn't the first time they've heard this warning from him. He's brought it up. This this apparently is a problem that he sees as a recurring issue for them. Because he's brought it up to them many times before. And even now he feels compelled to bring it up to them again. He wants them to remain vigilant in this area because of the especially alluring pull of this particular temptation. It's it's, it's alluring. It it blinds us. It leads us away. And so he doesn't mind preaching the same sermon over and over again because for Paul, originality isn't nearly as big a deal as persevering is. And notice that this isn't some vague theoretical hazard for Paul. It's left a swath of victims in its wake. He's seen this tragedy play out before his eyes many times before. Most likely some of Paul's own friends have been drawn away by these lies. And it breaks his heart. For him, this was personal. And even now, as he reminisces about them again, tears, we see that there, tears fill his eyes. He grieves for them. He grieves for the reproach that they have brought in the name of Christ and for the damage that they have caused the church and all of it for a temporary illusion. So to help them see this pattern of life for the real tragedy that it is, he fleshes it out in verse 19 with four graphic descriptions of these folks. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. That's not the kind of language that we're used to hearing today. But Paul is never afraid to use language that's appropriate to the threat. I read an article this past week about how the U.S. Health Department is considering their debating whether they should place graphic images on the outside of cigarette packages that show just how difficult or or how or how uh, uh, smoking cigarettes can harm your health. They want to drive home this point about how bad they are for you. They're going to use these images to do that. So if you still choose to open that box, you'll be doing so with your eyes wide open. Well, verse 19 is a very similar approach. Verse 19 is, is Paul doing the same thing. The mindset that these folks had adopted may appear reasonable. It may even be appealing to many, but this road is an extremely treacherous one. And so Paul is going to post as many warning signs and barricades as he possibly can to keep people from following down it. He wants to make it as unappealing as possible. So that's why he uses these descriptions. These are folks who are heading, he says, their end is destruction. That, rather than the perfection that he had talked about in the previous verses, of his end, He's drawing that comparison for them to see. Their end is destruction. Your end, if you're pursuing Christ, is perfection. It's glorification with him. Their end is destruction. And notice also that they, these folks, they're worshiping and serving their fleshly appetites. Maybe they're claiming to follow Christ with their lips, but their true God is their stomach. He, he appeals to a somewhat literal metaphor to portray whatever it is that they are craving in that moment. That's what's leading them whether that's the approval of people instead of bearing the shame of Christ, or it's indulging their lusts instead of mortifying their sin, or hanging on to a position of prestige instead of losing everything for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus. Their lives belong to their appetites. Their lives belong to the here and now. Now, he's not talking here about the struggle that we all have against sin. And he's not talking about the moment when a true believer stumbles along the way, but Instead, he's talking about an entire walking, a pattern of life, 
about a people who know nothing of the self-denial that Jesus called his followers to. It's never even, it's never even been an option for them. And we aren't exactly sure which things that Paul is referencing here when he says that they boast in their shame, but it's hard to not see his play on words here. They have substituted the eternal glory that he was seeking after on the day of Christ Jesus with a temporary glory that's rooted entirely in this world. And in the end, those things that they temporarily experienced as glory in this life, those exact same things that brought them applause in this life and glory in this world, are going to be the exact things that, they will, that will, they will experience shame over for all of eternity. That's what's going to bring them shame forever and ever. And then we see the thing that maybe most characterizes them. Their minds are fixed on the things of this world. Heaven either doesn't factor into their lives, or it's such a distant, irrelevant idea that it has no real bearing on the decisions that they make today, the way that they walk today. For them, they can't see anything beyond the here and now. Practically, this is all there is for them. And in short, they still view the world as their home. And as such, because that's how they view this world, that's how they view this life, this is their home, they are the very definition of what it means to be worldly. Putting each of these aspects together, then we can begin to see a shape start to take form. This is the profile of what worldliness looks like underneath, even if it claims Christ on the outside. Ultimately, they're living in such a way that makes it clear that gaining Christ is not their ultimate aim. And in that was the problem. Because underneath an attractive cover, this road stood diametrically opposed to the Christianity that Paul had passed down. But it's easy to read this and think, man, Philippians were in danger. But what about us? What about us as modern, enlightened people? Haven't we moved past this danger into some calmer and more civilized waters? As I mentioned at the outset... Assuming safety is the quickest route to danger. Paul certainly felt the need to bring this up often. And if he felt that need, if he thought that they should be warned often, we probably should pay attention. We probably should hear him. We don't want to be resting easy in a city with no walls. So in our remaining moments, let's compare. And let's see how imminent a threat this could potentially be for us today. Somewhere in the last 150 years of American Christianity, the Pauline example that was passed down through the centuries, through much of church history, has been watered down. And it's been watered down until all that's left is a shell of biblical Christianity. Being... A Christian has been distilled down to simply praying the sinner's prayer, getting wet, going to church on Easter and Christmas, and trying to cuss less. You have a swear jar. From then on, you can live however you want. In fact, even better, Jesus Jesus can be there. He can be a genie who, who reigns right now to make your life even happier. And don't worry. He's always there to pick up the tab when holiness has become too much of a struggle. It's the Christianity that we've inherited. That sanitized version is all around us. And it's not only the Christianity that we've inherited, it's also the Christianity that's most celebrated today. It's the Christianity that that makes the headlines and people applaud. And make no mistake, it's attractive because a tame Jesus, it's attractive even to an outside world, it's attractive to those inside the church, because a tame Jesus is going to place little to no claim on our lives. But a tame Jesus isn't the resurrected Lord that we sang to this morning. He isn't the one where we celebrated in communion. And by jettisoning, jettisoning this Calvary road, what you do 
is you unintentionally gut the very underpinning of Paul's hope, the resurrection to come. And, and in that, you lose your motivation. And when you lose your motivation, inevitably you lose your way. You're going to lose your way. It's very possible that the Christianity that we most identify with isn't actually scriptural at all. It's possible it has lost its way. And if we peel back all the layers and the hashtags, what we find is that this worldview, for all intents and purposes, is the very definition of worldliness. Even as it comes in a nicely wrapped box of friendliness and morality. It's equivalent to downloading Christianity Light. So we can hopefully get enough of the features without having to pay for the monthly subscription. By not looking to the path that leads us to glory. Ideas like repentance and obedience and perseverance, they've been lost. They sound foreign to our ears. Indeed, if we're honest... Much of what we see around us daily is summed up perfectly in verse 19. Paul would be weeping in our day. And so should we. Because we're living in a cultural moment where those who are asleep in this area will eventually fail the test. And practically speaking, it probably won't be an overnight failure. It won't be an immediate failure. Instead, it's going to come in the form of a thousand little compromises. Moments where we're forced to choose between hanging on to this life or looking to the glory to come. We're going to be confronted with it increasingly, daily, in our workplaces, in our classrooms, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. Wherever we live, we're going to face this. We're going to be forced to choose between the glory that comes from men and the glory that comes from God. We're going to have to decide if Jesus is Lord or if our appetites are. We must pick between the clear revelation of God in Christ Jesus as our ultimate authority or the modern wisdom of men who are rethinking some things in light of this century. Listen, Paul didn't give an an expiration date on the model that he left. The pattern that he, he handed down didn't expire in Philippi. His authority still stands in this letter, and so we don't get to have an asterisk. This isn't an area that anyone can cheat our way, their way around and still not have it show up in the worst possible moment. So if we are not a people who are continually clinging to Christ and looking to those who walk according to the pattern that we see in Scripture, the one that Paul left, then we will either fully cave in or we'll at least walk back the most offensive parts of historic Christianity. Only a church that holds fast to the coming weight of glory is assured of that, knows for it to be a fact that is unalterable. Only that church is going to be able to withstand when the cost comes. Should it alarm us at all that Paul's way of thinking is the exception rather than norm in much of American Christianity? That his claims are seen as a bit too rash? That his pattern is viewed as optional for us, rather than the very road that we ourselves personally must walk. That what he is advocating here is not a superhero Christianity, but rather basic discipleship, following a crucified Messiah, and looking to the future guarantees that we have in the gospel. We don't have to look far to see today the trail of carnage that this dualistic Christianity light is wreaking. It's no longer a faceless theoretical danger for us. It's personal. 
Maybe people that you thought you would run the ra- your entire Christian race with. Or maybe those that you were looking to, to run after. Maybe those people have turned aside. To our great sorrow, odds are more will follow. Know how clearly we need this repeated warning today. And we need it through tears. We don't want to be a people, callous cynics who denounce but do not weep. The world needs this call. This, the world needs us to stand, but it needs us to weep. The next generation needs us to stand, and they need us to weep. And as we feel this pull on our own souls, it can begin to feel overwhelming. If we look around as we feel, the, we feel it inside of ourselves. Every time we see this, the question comes to my mind at least, it, could that be me? Could I do that? Could I run so far and then turn away? How does anybody make it to the end? Will we be able to? It can feel overwhelming as we are confronted with this, inundated with it. But it's as those fears, it's as those fears try to force their way in, that we hear this summons from Paul afresh. Keep your eyes fixed. Look to those. Look to those of us who have made it through. Walk in my footsteps and you'll be safe. Because this is the road that our Savior walked. And his faithfulness will steady your feet in every moment and in every trial. The crucified Messiah is a kind king. In him we find all the things that we long for in this world, but we never quite quite can find. And in the end, we can look to scars on his hands, scars on his feet, and see a body that has been resurrected, that has overcome. We see proof. We sang about this morning. We see proof that we know exactly. We know exactly where this road leads. The one that we follow knew exactly where he was going. And nothing could stop him. Hell and this world threw everything they could. But he opened the way. That's our hope. That's our hope when those fears come. That's our hope when the doubts creep, want to creep in. That's the glory that cannot be shaken. It cannot be taken. It's the one that's fixed. It's the one that Paul had seen with his own eyes, and he said, there's a pattern to follow because I saw the end. It's a costly path, yes. But there's no questioning. There's no doubt of where it's going. Be careful who you're following actually knows where they're going. We have in these pages, a place, a road to walk. Let's hold fast to it. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. By the power of your Spirit, who's present with us even this morning, and by these words that were penned thousands of years ago to a very different audience, Speak to us directly today. Speak to us exactly where we are, exactly in the moment that we need them to preserve us and to keep us, to lift our eyes towards those, even in this moment this morning that we've had, to lift our eyes and look to the example that Paul has set before us. Lord, we pray that as we are tempted, as doubts or fears or we're tempted towards this pull, 
of worldly thinking. With our, we're tempted to leave our minds fixed on this life. We pray that you would lift our gaze to the glory that is to come. Lord, you ultimately, our hope is in you. Would you preserve us and protect us? We want to see your name glorified in our day. And we want to see this pattern passed on to those to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.